I don't see Jackie McLeod this morning, but Jackie McLeod told me this joke this week, and I want to share it with you. He said he had a dream about me and him going to meet St. Peter uh, at the gate. And um, he said he went in first, and Peter said, by all means, come on in. And uh, Jackie said he got a golden rod, a golden rod. And uh, he said, I come up to the gate, and they give me a wooden rod. And I said to him, hey, what's up with this? Jackie's a bus driver. I preach the gospel all my life. And what is it that Jackie gets a golden rod and I get a wooden one? And uh, Peter says to me, he says, well, I tell you, it's like this. We reward people when they get here for the works they did on earth. And I said to him, Peter, that is, I said, well, hey, I've, again, I've preached the gospel and Jackie's drove a bus. And he said, oh, but yes, while you was preaching, people went to sleep. While Jackie was driving, people was praying. I don't know nothing about Jackie's driving. I know a little about my preaching, and that is a possibility. The church going vertical is we look to and we trust in Almighty God to do for us what we are unable to do for ourselves. Don Cousins describes going vertical this way, and I quote, We want God to do the inconceivable the uncommon, the unexpected, the remarkable, the incomprehensible, so that God is the only explanation for what occurs. How do we get the church to go vertical in the 21st century because we are so accustomed to and comfortable with our horizontal pursuits? Let me ask that question again. How do we get the church to go vertical when we are so accustomed to and comfortable with our horizontal pursuits? The answer, see what you think. Show us our deepest needs. Say deepest. Show us our deepest needs are only met in going vertical and are never accomplished in our horizontal efforts. When you condense mankind's deepest needs, I want you to get your pen and paper. I want you to write this down. See what you think. When you condense mankind's deepest needs to only two, they would undoubtedly be to get God in our heart and get the devil off our back. Write those down. I believe mankind's deepest needs is to get God in our heart and get the devil off our back. And that happens only by going vertical. There are no amount of horizontal maneuvering or pursuing that will achieve that. If we want hell's monkey off our back, we must get heaven's master in our heart. Several years ago, Chuck Swindoll, I was reading one of his books, and he talked about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, meaning... There are things without or external that motivates us, and there are things within, internal, that motivates us. This morning, I want us to look at extrinsic motivation. Here it is, that which is without, to get Satan off our back. This should intrinsically motivate us to go vertical. Satan and his demons are universal in presence, yet they are personal in their pursuit. The devil is after all of God's creation collectively, but don't you uh, miss this. God is after me and you individually. I want you to listen to the apostle's uh, writes as he writes about uh, in Romans chapter 7. So turn there in your New Testament. The apostle writes about this longing to get sin and Satan off of his back. I pick it up in the 21st verse of Romans 7. Let's read the word of the Lord together. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but... I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. 
O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the, the flesh, the law of sin. Paul reflects in the writing of this chapter a season in his life where the law had made him aware of his sin, but did not provide him the strength to overcome its power and its dominion. Look at the 19th verse. For the good that I will to do, I do not. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Paul, like most people, wanted to do right, but he didn't. And he didn't want to do wrong, but often he did. You see, when we get in the trap of this downward spiral, we say, I know I shouldn't do that, or I wish I could do differently. So if we know that we shouldn't, then why do we? Here's why. Because the gospel has enlightened our mind to know what we should or should not do. But it, it's, it's, our failure is, is once the gospel enlightens our mind, is we've got to go after God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've got to go vertical in order to find the ability. We've got to connect with Christ in order to find the ability and the capacity to not do what we want, don't want to do and do what we need to do. Amen. It is only through intimacy with Christ that we are overcomers of what we long to overcome. The Bible tells us, thanks be unto God, who always leads us to triumph in Christ. I believe this season in Paul is writing about was before his personal encounter of Jesus Christ. And here's why I believe that. And I'm going to read three places just very briefly. Look at Romans chapter 6 and look at the 12th verse. Therefore, listen to this now. Again, I want you to think about this. This is a season in Paul's life that he's writing about in Romans 7 to where that he, he did not have the power of Christ. He had not connected with the living Christ through grace in order to give him the ability to overcome. But listen to this verse. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive. You see this? Now what does Paul say in present yourself to God? Go vertical. Huh? Go vertical. Present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin, here it is, for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law of sin but you are under the law of grace. Now listen very closely. You can hear the gospel all of your life and all that's going to do is make you aware of how miserable you are without God unless... You go vertical unless you connect to Christ through your faith in his grace. Look at Romans chapter 7, uh, verse 24 and 25, and I've done read that. But again, so Paul talks about this predicament, and I've read it, and he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Who is going to set me free from this knowledge of what is right but lack the ability to carry it out? And then he gives the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. One more verse, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Somebody said, thank you, Jesus. These verses remind us that what we cannot accomplish through horizontal self-efforts of keeping religious law is accomplished through the gift of grace in Christ Jesus. Understand the context of this. For the sinful Saul, there was no shortage of horizontal credentials. Now watch this. He was, he was circumcised, not crucified. He was circumcised the eighth day from the house of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. Concerning the righteousness of the law, he was blameless. 
He had the most impressive resume of any of his colleagues, but he couldn't get the monkey off his back, not until he went vertical and connected with God and became the saved Paul through Jesus Christ, his Lord. There is no space and time on this side of eternity that we do not have to contend with sin and Satan's influence. But in Christ, we do not have to succumb to their dominion. And that's the great news. That's the great news. It may be out there and it may be touching us where we live every day, but we do not have to give in to, succumb to Satan's power, Satan's dominion. It's through his influence, but watch this, watch this. This is why you want to be aware of his influence and and resist that. And we're going to talk about that just in a second. Because it's through his influence that he makes steps to bring us under his dominion. You don't want to miss that. There's no way we can find a place in this side of eternity that we don't have to contend with Satan's influence. But here's the clincher. It is through his influence that he brings us to his and under his dominion if we don't resist. Therefore, the more upward we go to God in our life, the less Satan can pull us downward in our living. All of creation may not know what they want, but all of us, whether we know it or not, we want the devil off our back. And the more vertical we go with God, the better our chances he will get off. And again, you'll see this just in a moment. The devil and his demons love it when we buy into the lies that we are victims of darkness and there is nothing that we can do except learn to cope with the collateral fallout. He loves that. And there are so many people buying into that. And I'm talking about us as Christians. He loves it when we think we are limited to minimizing and cleaning up after the aftermath in the path of his destruction. But we need to know that we are more than conquerors through Christ and we have one greater than us than he that is within the world. And the way that we access in reality what Christ has done on the cross is a five-letter word and it's called resist. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. The means of connecting personally with the power of Christ and what he did on the cross over Satan is withstanding his influence by resisting. I think I can illustrate this. Now, keep, follow this. So uh, the students uh, and, and, and those of you that are single this morning, if a boy or a girl or a young man or a young lady or an older man or an older lady, wherever you are in your single life, acts like they have an interest in you, and you have absolutely no interest in them. What should you do? Now, don't answer. It's a loaded question, okay? What should you do? I want to say to you, resist them. Now, the word resist carries more than just ignore. This is crucial. You've got to remember this. The word resist in the Greek carries far more than just ignore them. And you're going to see something here in a moment. It means that we stand against them. Now, now, why wouldn't we just simply ignore them? I want you to hold that thought. Here's the rest of this James passage that I read. Therefore, submit to God, resist Oppose, stand against the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. As we resist the devil by going vertical, by drawing near to God, the devil flees from us. Here's what is so interesting. This word flee means to seek shelter. Oh, my goodness. This word flee means to seek shelter to get away from danger. Watch this. It's the same identical Greek word that Paul used when instructing young Timothy to flee youthful lust. Get away from danger. Seek shelter from youthful lust. Whoa. This Bible, James, says when we submit to God by drawing near God, going vertical, the devil seeks shelter. We become dangerous to him. Now, I see this 
principle manifested in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus resisted Satan, and the results of him resisting Satan was he left for a season. By running hard to God, Satan fears the danger of his lies being exposed. I know we know this, but we need to be reminded this. Satan has built an empire in the world we live in right now. I want you to think about this. Satan has built a diabolical empire on deceiving precious people to believe his lies. He has God's creation locked up in a house of cards. And when we pursue Christ, the embodiment of truth, those cards crumble. That's why we, he seeks shelter when we resist him. He knows by us learning and living God's truth, we will expose him. And when he is exposed for who he really is, he knows we will walk in Christ's victory. You see, that is why we become dangerous to him. We are a threat to Satan's plot when we set our affections on Christ, when we go vertical with his will, Jesus' will for our lives. I'm not sure how resist the devil got changed to ignore him in many segments of Christianity, but I know this. When it did, the enemy gained a great strategic advantage against us. Now, I told you to hold a thought about the students. Often, maybe if you, if there's this boy, this girl uh, that, that uh, has an interest in you and you have absolutely no interest in them, that just ignore them and they'll go away. Okay, hold that thought and I'm glad you did. What should you do? Resist them, stand against them. Notice I didn't say ignore them, but resist them. Now, a passive person might walk away if you simply ignore them. But aggressive person is not, it's not enough to ignore. You must oppose, stand against, resist. Have you ever understood? And he says, I don't understand. I don't pay him or I don't pay her any attention. I don't talk to them. I don't text. I don't call. I, I have no conversation with them. I don't speak to them. Why don't they get it? Why can't they take no for an answer? You see, they need more than just ignored. They need resisted. Oh, watch this. Watch this. You know this. Satan is not passive. Now, I'm not suggesting your boy or this girl that is wanting to, uh, to date you. And by the way, that's not an outdated phrase, as some of you may think it is. I just asked them. I asked them. I just went over and asked them, okay? And they told me, no, that's what we call it, dating, hanging out. Okay. All right, here we go. Satan is not passive. Ignoring him fuels, watch this now, ignoring the devil fuels his incentive to come after you. You see, some of us are not even ignoring him. A lot of us ignore him, but it's not enough. He's too aggressive. He has to be resisted. Now, watch this. Do you know, according to Barna's research, that 60% of Christians in America agree or strongly agree, they either agree or strongly agree that Satan is only a symbol of evil? Wow. No wonder. No wonder the enemy is wreaking havoc in so many of our lives. We just basically think the best way is just ignore him. It's just a symbol of evil, or at least a good percent of them. But watch what Peter says. The devil was a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You see, we think by ignoring the devil, he goes away. Actually, he comes after us harder. How do I know that? How do I know that? I don't know a lot about lines, but I know this. Ignoring lines doesn't deter their pursuit. In fact, what little I know about lines and what little I've saw and what little I've read about lines, ignoring lines doesn't deter their pursuit. In fact, it causes them to come harder. Today, the call is resist the devil. Literally, visibly stand against him, oppose him, and he'll get off your, off your back. Amen. The word that Peter uses here, in, um, is, the word that he uses, devour, it means to gobble up. I used to say, the devil will eat your lunch. No, 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 that's wrong. No, that, that is not right. The devil won't eat your lunch. The devil will eat you for lunch. Amen. Yet when we draw near to God, when we go vertical, 
we are not as appetizing. In fact, when we go vertical, when we go vertical, he flees. He seeks shelter because, my dear friend, and I can illustrate that. Did you hear about this uh, Wolf County boy? They made deputy sheriff. Him and a couple of his friends were out hunting one day, and he was continually bragging, just freshly, newly sworn in as deputy sheriff, and he was continually bragging and boasting about how much authority that his badge gave him. And while they were hunting, a big bull got after them. The young deputy was more husky than his two leaner, agile friends. And so they were out running him. And they seen, the friends seen that the bull was gaining on the deputy. And one of them hollered, show him your badge. Yeah, you probably heard that from Carl Hurley, didn't you? I just changed the name to indict the innocent. There is no questions. Listen. There is no question many of our horizontal accomplishments gives us power and authority in this earthly realm. Money, I'll mention three or four, prestige, education, position. You can show the devil your bank account. You can point to your degree. You can remind him of the prefix that is before your name. But that badge don't mean diddly to the devil. In the spirit realm, you best show him your Jesus. Because apart from Christ, you have, I have absolutely no authority in that realm. And that realm is where he resides. And that realm is where he strategically plans to come against your life and my life personally against his against God's church in that realm is where he maneuvers and moves and shakes and puts together a plan to thwart the plan of God it is in that realm and you and I have no authority apart from Jesus Christ we better go vertical if we want to get this monkey off our back here's what really is interesting about going vertical don't miss this we not only have the capacity to resist the devil But we have the ability to retrieve what the devil has gotten from us. Which gives him another reason. Now you wonder why? You wonder why that James uses this Greek word to seek shelter, to flee from danger when we resist him, when we draw near to God, when God draws near to us. You see, this gives him another reason to see the danger in confronting blood-bought believers of Jesus Christ. I know that some of us are terrified of the enemy, of evil and the devil. But can I tell you something? If you and I would fully and completely understand our position in Jesus Christ, I'll tell you, he is terrified of you. In Ephesians 4.27, Paul says, Neither give place, underline this word place, to the devil. The word, the Greek word there topography and it refers it's where we get our English word that's not the Greek word topography the the root of the Greek the root of that word is where we get our English word topography and it refers to ground or a specific spot other translation would say don't give Satan a chance or opportunity don't give him any leeway the truth is it's when we have given Satan the truth is we have given Satan a lot more ground than he has unlawfully taken and can I tell you something now here's what's really interesting In Christ, he cannot take any ground. The only way he gets ground is we give him ground. Now, you got to watch this. Notice how Paul says this. You can even pick this up easily by just reading this. Neither give place. Don't give up ground to the devil. Why? Because Paul knows and the devil knows he can't take ground. Because you're blood-bought. Amen. You're purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. You belong to God. You see, this is why we not only have the ability in Christ to resist him, but we have the ability to retrieve the ground that he took from us. And in many of our cases, before Christ. Here's the explanation of why that's true. 
As long as our journey is limited to horizontal pursuits, we give ground away frequently. When our journey is mingled with vertical longings, he ceases getting more ground, and we begin to retrieving ground through Christ that he has had for so long. Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus has come to give, make alive, and restore. Did you ever hear people say this, who come to Christ? Did you ever hear this phrase come out of people who come to Christ? Somewhere in their conversation, they will say, God gave me back my life. Do you know what they're saying? I'm retrieving ground the devil stole from me when I was away from Christ. I'll tell you, there is an internal incentive to go vertical and spend less time in horizontal pursuing But there is an external, there is an extrinsic incentive, and that's to get this guy off our back. He'll always be around to aggravate, to tempt, to influence, and to to try to get way in. But I'm telling you, if this book is true and if Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead and all three are facts, we are greater than he that is on our back and trying to make us think the only thing we can do is just put up with him and deal deal with the fallout of it. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you this morning. We come with you with a heart and a passion that says, Oh God, may I go vertical. May I draw near to God. May this congregation, may we draw near to God. Because we're told that as we resist the devil by drawing near to God and by submitting to God, that he flees from us, he takes shelter. I thank you, Christ, for your accomplishments on the cross. And I am so sorry that so many of us are living below our God-given through Jesus on the cross opportunities and position. And so it's in Jesus' name this morning that we would come and that we would go vertical. Because God, on Christmas, you went global. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, for going global, for first going global so we could go vertical. In Jesus' name, let's stand together. Would you come?